Today I'm going to show you how to read a drug product label and I think a lot of people are intimidated by the small text and some of the technical language but I assure you, you could read it maybe only high school level knowledge of science is required you may have to google a few terms but I assure you, you can get a lot of information from the product label this is just what is seen in the packaging and it is meant for healthcare providers but I think anyone could get a lot of information from it including the common side effects of drugs the reason that it's used the contraindications drug drug interactions and even results results of clinical trials and special situations like pregnancy, breastfeeding, other medical conditions. So let's take a look. I'm going to use as an example the drug Ocrevus for multiple sclerosis and you can just type into Google Ocrevus product label and this is required by the FDA. You could also put in the drug monograph which is the same thing and you're looking for this website accessdata.fda.gov and this is exactly what appears in the actual product, the piece of paper that's folded up very tightly, and don't be intimidated by the small text, let's zoom in a little bit. So the way the label is organized, the first page is just an overview. What is it for? How is it administered? What are the doses? What are the common side effects? If you just want the basic information, just read the first page. Then there's a table of contents, and of course the following pages are just what's in that table of contents, and we'll go over all of this. And uh, just to look at the first page, you can see it says the name of the drug, Ocrevus, the generic name, Ocrelizumab, and it's for intravenous use through the IV, and it was initially FDA approved in 2017. So indications, meaning what is the drug for, for what medical conditions, and you can see this is for relapsing or primary progressive forms of multiple sclerosis. Some drugs have many indications. For example, the drug Prilosec is used for both acid reflux and stomach ulcers. Some drugs just have one indication. And often drugs are used off-label, meaning it's used for medical conditions even though they don't appear on the product label. The next is dosage and administration, and the, for this particular drug, it's an immunosuppressant for multiple sclerosis, and so they recommend people get screened for hepatitis B, and it can also cause infusion reactions, and so you pre-medicate with other medications, including methylprednisolone, which is a steroid, and an antihistamine, such as Benadryl, prior to each infusion. The starting dose is 300 milligrams IV. Two weeks later, the same dose of 300 milligrams, and after that, 600 milligrams every six months. It can be diluted, and they recommend observation for one hour after the infusion, just because it can cause infusion reactions. Dosage forms and strengths. Many drugs have a ton of different doses and formulations. For Ocrevus, there's just a single one, a 300 milligram vial. Contraindications. This is reasons that you can't take the drug. Now, of course, there are many reasons maybe you wouldn't want to take an immunosuppressant. Like if you've had many severe infections in the last year, you probably wouldn't want to take this drug, but it's just listing the well-known contraindications, sort of the absolute reasons you shouldn't take the drug, such as having active hepatitis B infection because it can cause reactivation of hepatitis B, or if you have a history of life-threatening infusion reaction to Ocrevus, such as anaphylaxis, that makes a lot of sense. Let's move on to warnings and precautions. These are kind of the major side effects which could occur. So infusion reactions, people can get rash, hives, that kind of thing, and they recommend permanently discontinuing Ocrevus if a life-threatening or disabling infusion reaction occurs, obviously. Infections, this is an immunosuppressant, and so for people who have active infections, you may want to delay the infusion. Also, for vaccines that contain living components, they're unsafe in people taking Ocrevus. And malignancies or cancers, there may be an increased risk of malignancy, including breast cancer with Ocrevus. A little bit more on that later. Okay, adverse reactions are the more common re reactions that people get. So in relapsing MS, and they compared it to Rebif, which is another disease-modifying therapy, which isn't an immunosuppressant in the clinical trials OPERA-1 and OPERA-2. They found more upper respiratory tract infections and infusion reactions, and for primary progressive MS, more upper respiratory tract infections, infusion reactions, skin infections, and lower respiratory tract infections, and you can see more on that later in graphical form and numerically, and if you want to report a suspected adverse reaction, you can contact Genentech, the drug maker, or go to the FDA website. And they talk a little bit about specific populations, so in pregnancy, based on animal data, it could cause fetal harm, so it's not recommended to take this drug 
during pregnancy. Now, again, here's the table of contents, but we'll just go through each item briefly. I'm doing this mainly to show how to find information, not specifically to go over Ocrevus, but again, you can see the indications for use, the common contraindications, and there's some technical stuff like what to do prior to every infusion, and you can see how the infusion is given. The first dose, they start at a very slow rate, 30 mils per hour, and go up slowly, so there's some technical information that may not be too useful to you, like how to prepare and store the drug, for example. And, you know, again, there aren't different doses and strengths of this medication. So let's look more in detail to the warnings and precautions. So infections, you can see the actual statistics of infections. And so in the relapsing MS trials, 58% of people taking Ocrevus had some type of infection. And this could be something very mild, like a cold or a cold sore or athlete's foot, versus 52% in rebif treated patients. So 58 versus 52% not a huge difference. In the primary progressive MS trial, it was 70% versus 68%. So not an enormous difference. And they talk a little bit about each individual infection, respiratory tract infections, herpes viral infections, and the rare infection PML, which there's a single case known to be associated with Ocrevus. Hepatitis B reactivation, as I mentioned, and some comments on vaccination. Okay, what about malignancies, risk of cancer? They say in the clinical trials, breast cancer occurred in six out of 781 females treated with Ocrevus versus none out of 668 treated with Rebif or placebo. So there's a possible signal there as well. Now, it's very interesting to look at the clinical trials experience. Some people may not have access to the actual published articles, so the product label is a great way just to find the quick results of all the clinical trials in one place, at least the major pivotal clinical trials. And usually they refer to the studies in a very professional way, so they don't use the pet names, they just call them study one and study two, and these refer to the two opera trials, Ocrevus versus Relif in relapsing multiple sclerosis, and you can can see the risk of different side effects. So upper respiratory tract infections, 40% with Ocrevus, 33% with Rebif, not a huge difference. Infusion reactions, 34% with Ocrevus, 10% with Rebif. So even if you get saline infusion, 10% have some kind of subjective reaction, I guess. And you can see not a huge difference in the rate of infections, though lower respiratory tract infections, eight versus five. So there is some difference there. This is in the primary progressive MS trial, which is the Oratorio study. They just call it study three. And you can see upper respiratory tract infections, 49% with Ocrevus, 43% with placebo, etc. And they talk a little bit about laboratory abnormalities. You can have low levels of immunoglobins, and they do correlate with increased risk of infections, particularly immunoglobin G, less than 500. What about drug-drug interactions? So really for Ocrevus, there aren't any major interactions. Here they just talk about the potential increased risk if you take Ocrevus with other immunosuppressants. With a lot of drugs, there are specific interactions, like two drugs are metabolized by the same cytochrome system in the liver, and so you want to avoid that combination. For Ocrevus, there aren't many. And it can actually get quite complicated because some drug-drug interactions can be trivial, and it's safe to continue the two in combination whereas for others, it's, it's really a big deal. Okay, let's move on to specific populations. So in pregnancy, as I said, it's not really recommended, and they kind of explain why that in animal studies and in human neonates, you can have low B lymphocytes in the fetus, not necessarily because the drug causes birth defects or prevents normal organ formation, but it can actually weaken the immune system in the fetus. They talk about a few animal studies, and that's why they sort of study these drugs in animals, because otherwise we only know information from accidental pregnancy registries, and they, and they talk about the potential problems like depletion of B lymphocytes in lymphoid tissue of these monkeys, for instance. Okay, what about lactation? And, you know, if you're breastfeeding, what do you need to know? What about reproductive potential? There's no data on pediatric use or geriatric use. Then we kind of move on to the pharmacology of the drug. So what is it and how does it work? So ocrelizumab is a recombinant humanized monoclonal antibody directed against CD20 expressing B cells. So that's quite a mouthful, but what it means is this is an artificial immunoglobin. It's a biological compound, an antibody, and it targets the protein CD20 on the surface of B cells 
and breaks them open. And it talks a little bit about the inactive ingredients in Ocrevus as well and how it works exactly. It uses a mechanism called antibody-dependent cellular cytolysis. What about the pharmacodynamics and pharmacokinetics? So it talks about like how long does it take the drug to work? And you can see B cell counts in the blood go down by 14 days after infusion. So the effect in suppressing your immune system is actually fairly quick. The next question, how long does it take your B cells to come back? It says B cell counts return to either baseline or lower limit of normal after 72 weeks. So it has a very, very prolonged effect. Even though it's given every six months, the actual biological effect could last longer than one year easily. And in 90% of people within 2.5 years, the B cell counts come back up. So in some people, there can be this very prolonged B cell depletion. What about the pharmacokinetics? One thing that may be notable, I mean, you're probably not too interested in things like the volume of distribution, would be the half-life. So you can see the terminal half-life is 26 days. What that means is that the drug concentration in your blood goes down to half it would, of what it was in 26 days. So for instance, let's say you started a concentration of 1. After 26 days, it goes down to a concentration of 0.5. And after another 26 days, it goes down to a concentration of 0.25 and so forth. And generally speaking, after about five half-lives, a drug is essentially considered to be out of your body. Uh, it talks about the metabolism and special populations. So one common thing would be kidney and liver disease. So renal impairment or kidney disease. So they say patients with mild renal impairment were included in the clinical trials and there was no change. So if you have mild kidney disease, it's fine to take this drug. For moderate to severe kidney disease, it really hasn't been studied. What about hepatic impairment or liver disease? Patients with mild hepatic impairment were included in the trials, and there was no significant change. So if you have mild liver disease, it's probably okay. If you have moderate to severe liver disease, it probably hasn't been studied very well. They talk about the non-clinical toxicology, in other words, in cell culture or animal studies, and they talk about the potential for cancer generation or the formation of mutations or impairment with fertility. This drug is not particularly known to cause infertility, though, of course, there are the concerns in pregnancy I discussed below. Now, this is perhaps the most useful section, which is the result of clinical studies. So, of course, you could find these studies on your own if you want to, but this is just a good way to get a, a summary of the key clinical data, the two phase three trials, or in the case of this drug, three phase three trials, because there was a separate study, the oratorio study for primary progressive MS, you can just get the key results. And of course, if you want, you could read over the details of the studies, or you could just scroll down to the charts. And so these are studies one and two. These are the studies in relapsing multiple sclerosis, a randomized trial of Ocrevus versus Rebif. And just to give an example, the main clinical endpoint was the annualized relapse rate, the number of relapses per person per year. And in study one, you could see it was 0.156. And in study and in, with Rebif, it was 0.292. And that represents a 46% decline. In study two, it was 0.155 with Ocrevus versus 0.29 with Rebif. And that represents a 47% decline. So you can see there's a consistency between the two trials, which is what we want to see. They looked at some other outcomes, such as the proportion who did not have disability progression. It was 40% fewer taking Ocrevus compared to Riva. And you can see the suppression of active or gadolinium-enhancing lesions. It was 94% effective and 95% effective in the two trials. And so that's kind of the clinical and MRI data. So you can get a sense of how effective is this medication in real life. Then we can move to this plot of confirmed disability progression. You can see the proportion who had disability progression taking Rebif versus those taking Ocrevus. And you can see there was a 40% difference there. And then you can move on to the studies on primary progressive MS. This is the oratorio study, so Ocrevus versus placebo. And you can see the primary outcome was the proportion of patients with 12-week confirmed disability progression. It was 32.9% with Ocrevus, 39.3% with placebo. So not a huge difference, but 24% less. And you can see based on the p-value less than 0.05, it was statistically significant. The MRI outcomes were more impressive. So you get a sense like, what are the side effects of the drug? How effective is the drug? And this is just the graph of confirmed disability progression. Placebo on top versus Ocrevus on the bottom. Not a huge difference, but a real and statistically significant difference. So, you know, there's some things that you may not care about, like the storage and handling of the drug. And, you know, 
some patient counseling information. This may be a little bit more straightforward if you find the above to be too technical. Anyways, I hope this was helpful to you. If you have any questions, please post in the comments below.